I am Alex with Deloitte. I have a PhD, but I try not to act like it. I spent some time at DARPA, USAID, serve clients like NASA. And I'm honored to be following the previous group because early in my career, I got to work with folks like that other Alex who just presented through the Young African Leaders Initiative, YALI, among other programs. And it, it truly is amazing. The things that um, minds who are too often overlooked have to offer. So with that, I'm gonna to speak to you in the next 14 minutes and 35 seconds about making drones smarter. Smart enough to go not just the last mile, but the last inch into what our clients need to succeed in the real world. It looks like this. You may think that Deloitte counts beans. We do that. We're some of the best in the world at it. We also have a consulting side of house. And on that side of house, we enable our clients to fulfill their unique missions faster, better, whatever those indicators are to them. OptoAI is part of that process. And to give you an idea of this sort of end-to-end -end expertise, we make sure to bring, I know AI, I do not know the explosive ordnance disposal. So when I need to do some EOD, I call my friend Chris, who was JSOC EOD. And we work together to make sure that the solutions we're developing are not a hammer seeking a nail, but rather that we understand the real world impact, the real world situation, environment, priorities that we are stepping into. And then we work together to develop those solutions. So I, I really do have the privilege of being a solutions architect. I'm gonna run through some show and tell today. Four examples, they look like the clients um, describing to us what they need, and then you'll see how we were able to uh, fulfill those. Our tailored best-in-class algorithms, I'm gonna say that again, tailored best-in-class AI algorithms is what we do. You'll see a lot of integration here. You'll see hardware, you'll see other softwares. What we focus on is the AI, both training and inference. We're able to use those algorithms to digitize the real world, simulate things. As it turns out, it is expensive and or not allowed to set things on fire. So we pretend to do that in modeling and simulation. We use that to train both people and AI algorithms, overcoming the bottleneck that is the data dearth we find, especially in rare events. One example of that is that when I was in Montana, a member of the Department of Forestry approached me and asked, could we have found a red backpack? Yes. Why? They lost a hiker. And the last photo she posted on social media was her wearing a red backpack. Had they been able to key in on that, that's the level of specificity that would have allowed them to succeed in their mission. So that's one example of how important it is to be able to rapidly train a model and to adapt, to customize a general model to fulfill a particular purpose. Once we have those algorithms ready to go, we put it back out into the real world. We can do that on board, or we can do that in modeling and simulation. Right now, we're focused on sensing, ISR. We are also able to have actuation in various ways, whether that is dropping a communications puck or anything else you can imagine. Here's what those use cases look like. Capital infrastructure, distributed infrastructure, chemical warfare agent detection, and a counter unmanned aerial systems. So I'm gonna focus each of those. They each have a video and off we go. It weighs heavily on me knowing that we just don't have the resources or the technology to continue to maintain and build for the future. If I'm an inspector and my job is to go out and inspect this bridge, I might be over water, the bridge might be a hundred feet tall, all sorts of other obstacles. It's actually a really hard task to do. We help government leaders see the past, the present, and the future of some of their most pressing problems. They were able to fly really close to all aspects, all nooks and crannies, and identify really quickly in short order where the problem areas are and what we should prioritize with respect to inspection and fixing. I think the moment that sold it for the mayor is when he put the goggles on. Let's stay. Oh. 
It was remarkable. I mean, there we were sitting on the side of the Ohio River and I put on these high tech goggles and all of a sudden I'm in the inside of a bridge. That you actually saw in augmented reality, the drone flying, what the drone was seeing. And then all of a sudden these things started popping up, it said, oh, there's a problem over there. And he almost went to go touch it. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. These drones scan structures and assets in real time. And then our algorithms basically say, I see a problem or I don't see a problem. What used to take them three months or six months, you would now be able to do just in a couple minutes. I mean, the idea that that much technology can just be in the palm of your hand, unlocking so many opportunities and resources for you, it's just mind blowing. So now he's able to make decisions about his critical infrastructure that will save him time, reduce cost, and possibly even save lives. <laughs> So in that example, I'll call out a couple of things. We are agnostic to the platform, to the sensors. So some of the ones that we work with are the Teledyne FLIR, Sky Ranger and Sky Raider line, the Freefly, Teal, Skydio, whether they are fixed wing or they are rotocopter. And that ability to adapt to whatever the client already has on hand is important. Going up and saying, hey, we need you to buy another couple million dollars of drones and start over. Nobody wants to hear that. So we're able to adapt to them. Here's another example. The $23 billion a year problem that is vegetation management. I was surprised to learn that that much energy goes into trimming trees around power lines. That's because it is the number one cause of outages and it is the number one cause of wildfires. And these utilities don't like getting sued for a billion plus dollars when it can be traced back to something that they should have done better on. So with that, we've reduced their cost by up to 70%. And I'll show you how we're doing that. This is a digital twin from a single flyover. We have our algorithm set up to do all surface capture, not just all object capture. And it's down to the level of resolution that we can pick up the wires, the individual wires, which as anyone who's in the space knows, are difficult to pull out and discern. We then take that into our 2D to 3D photogrammetry, and we're doing segmentation down to the pixel level. And those of you paying attention will say that's 3D. And yes, it is voxelized segmentation, right? So we have a whole object there. And instead of comparing it to some golden standard, which is the uh, legacy computer vision. We are using that with our AI algorithms that have been trained on augmented and synthetic data sets. We flew maybe a couple dozen of these poles and turned them into a couple dozen thousand to the point that we can tell you that fuse is blown, the other fuse is not, even if it's hiding behind a tree branch. What some of our clients get most excited about are things that we might otherwise put into a, a category of automation or RPA. This is a report that it spits out and it's telling you this is what I saw, where, this is the level of confidence, this is the level of severity. And that's what they were most excited about because sometimes they would go out and do all that hard work of collecting data and then it would sit in some database somewhere for weeks, for months before the next team got to take a look at it. So this gets rid of that um, hiccup. The next one we'll take a look at is chemical warfare agents for what is hopefully not something that everyone here thinks about every day, but I guarantee that JPEO, CBRND, our client, as well as DITRA do. Any second now. So we're seeing them in the woods. Yeah, it's a little hundred percent like identify the person. Get those coordinates for the initial yeah. um, bull were late. Did you see the uh thermal with they getting? Yeah. You're bounding left to the left side of the road that got a sauce. Is it dance when you go forward fifty meter yeah. and lights finally? Yes. So something's obviously on fire right here. Set the cows and speed. 
Wilson Tanger. So this was that one bleach that I heard. Uh, they were fort. I said you were the various altars. I don't know if they want to confirm your side of that. RTB. Go check that place. Yeah. So, out in the field, we were able to have a gunnery sergeant tell us, I used a bleep out of Opto AI. And here's what I don't like about it. So it's that candid feedback from the people who are impacted most by this technology that we're, we were happy to integrate and have now updated what we offer accordingly. There are other capabilities that matter to people who are further from the front line or want to do planning, training, et cetera. What you're seeing here is plume modeling, multimodal plume modeling. The item you see on the left is 3D sand table. On the right, we have 2D on a tablet or on the web. And those are two different views of the same thing. The green dots are turning red as it starts to pick up a concerning chemical signal. A red box pops up on the right side as the computer vision picks up something. It looks bad, but it isn't. So it ignored the decoy, went for the actual threat, and now you can have your SME, your expert, your situation room drop into that environment virtually without needing to put on mop gear. And they can walk around that space. Anyone who has had the opportunity to be in what we call an unlimited reality space can tell sometimes things just make more sense when you're immersed in it in 3D. The last one I'll share with you today is counter UAS. And yes, this whole time I've been talking about UAS capabilities. However, being able to play both sides of that coin makes us better at both. So with that said, here's what we have called OptoWolf. We're protecting the green bubble in the set. The enemy drone outs built. Do we have computer audio for this one? Or in? So one close-in weapon system on the roof. Ah, well, that's me. You know that guy. It's just, tell you what, I'm going to start over again. This is a digital twin of a real-world comp. We're protecting the green bubble in the center. What I'm saying is we're protecting the green bubble in the center. And it keeps going around the bushes, the trees, the buildings, and doesn't work. Let's five, zero percent success. Now, fine, we're going to throw five systems at it instead of one. Uh, what if we... 50 percent success, but that's not great. All right, we have done the best they can. They're networked. They are able to like, connect to each other and, you know, tip IPO you know, still only gets you to 66 percent of the ground. One... We're hitting some um, air to air what? combat UAS gets you to 70%. So right there, you may have just saved a couple million dollars going from five systems down to one and having the data to prove that that is actually the better solution. Then we let the algorithm loose because it's been learning like we have and it develops in the same kind of multi-agent reinforcement learning that you've probably seen uh, in hide and seek among other applications that uh, allow us to see that a combination of one close-in weapon system, one air-to-air -air UAS are going to give us a nearly 100% success rate. And it'll tell you not just you should have them in the arena, but you should put it on this pitch of the roof and not that pitch. And this is not just statistical. It's not just Monte Carlo. It is, as we are here at an AI expo, an AI approach to doing these things. Again, that's best in class. So with that said, and one minute left, um, these are the folks to get in touch with. Todd is right there. He is our managing director for AI for our defense security and justice space. I'm Alex, uh, and I have the privilege of working with Mike Sagala, the gentleman you saw in the, PH in the video, um, who earned his PhD in part discovering the Higgs boson. So with that said, I'm going to be around after if anyone wants to put on a HoloLens 2, a Quest 3, a Magic Leap 2, or pretty much any other head-mounted device and try this for themselves. Thank you. Yep.